Hi, everyone. This is QI, and I work for eBay Traffic Engineering Team. Today, my colleague uh, Bala and I are going to share our journey uh, for running Envoy as Edge Proxy at eBay. So uh, here is the overall agenda. In the beginning, we're going to briefly talk about the Edge, then the software stack of the Edge, the L4 and L7 control plane and data plane, uh, what we did, how we did it, and after that, we'll cover the monitoring and the deployment aspect of the Edge proxy. And towards the end, we will talk about some, some learnings and the Q&A session. So first of all, um, why Edge? So in the past, eBay only has data center in the US. Uh, as traffic grow from a global user, we will re realize having the infrastructure that can deliver content faster to our end user is really critical for us. It's not just about ensure um, better user experience for people visiting our website, but that also translates into um, more revenue, uh, more GMV for e-commerce company like eBay. And all that translates into um, getting closer to the end user. So as for the edge, it's made of a bunch of pops or a point of presence uh, that is deployed around the globe. So networking-wise, it's a location that interconnects eBay network to the internet. Uh, Computer-wise, it's much less uh, footprint than the data center. So typically, just a few racks of servers. So in eBay, uh, we have Kubernetes cluster deploying each of the pub, and by using Kubernetes as a general purpose running platform, uh, we run our edge proxy stack there. And by having the edge proxy in the pub, we are able to terminate SSL connection closer to the end user, um, hence save expensive SSL round trip latency uh, across the continents. That uh, actually increased the page, page load speed. And once we started that journey, by converting into a software-based edge proxy uh, on the edge, we realized that there are much more things we can do than just increase the speed. Uh, for example, it can help to us to increase the site availability. Uh, it allows us to do security stuff at Edge, et cetera, et cetera. But it all starts with a software-based Edge proxy. So um, as mentioned, uh, we use Edge proxy as our non source gateway on uh, Edge. It consists of one layer of self, uh, layer four software load balancer and one layer of uh, L7 proxy using Envoy. So just to double click on why we need these two tiers. So each L4 instance advertises the web through BGP to draw the traffic. And once the HTTP request hitting a pub, the TCP packet belong to that TCP flow will be sent to one of the L4 instance through the ECMP routing. Uh, since it's ECMP routing, so all of the L4 instance will be in uh, active mode, be actively part of the cluster. And once the packet get there, the L4 will determine where to send the packet to um, for the L7 in the back. And each L7, sorry, um, each L4 uses the rendezvous hashing to determine um, the scheduling result. Um, so for the packet belong to the same TCP flow, it's guaranteed to reach the same L7. So with the rendezvous hashing, um, it helps us to operate L7 cluster in a controlled manner. For example, in case we want to roll out the L7 software upgrade, we can simply delete a, a single L7, so that will trigger the connection draining from L4 to L7. Once the connection is drained, L4 will be removing that L7 from the hash table. Um, and um, that will not have any impact for the connections between the L4 and the remaining of the L7s, meaning no uh, SSO disruption. Um, Adding a, a L7 proxy to the cluster, on the other hand, um, will not have any impact for the established connection between L4 and L7s, and will only trigger the least amount of uh, hash, hash rebinds. So that's um, L4. So our architecture actually follows the same design pattern for both L4 and L7. So both has a control plane and a data plane. So for L4, we use IPv as, as our data plane, uh, we have a homegrown project called the ELB directory for the control plane. For the L7, we use Envoy as our data plane, and we use uh, Ingress control as our control plane. 
So everything is uh, spec driven, Decathlon model driven. So to operate the cluster, we create specs through Kubernetes API server. Then our L4 and L7 going to translate that specs into the L4 and L7 configs accordingly. And uh, since it's a Kube uh, native deployment, everything runs in a pod, so we can easily uh, horizontally scale uh, either L4 or L7. Um, a little bit more regarding the L4 software load balancer. Uh, as mentioned earlier, it's IPVS based data plane. Uh, we have an in-house build kernel module called IPVS TBL. A TBL stands for the table. So that kernel module will schedule the packet based on the, the hashing table. And that hashing table is generated from the user space by the control plane uh, ELB director. And the ELB director programs the kernel by pushing down that uh, data into kernel through Netlink. Um, each L4 pod has a unique container that is res responsible for load the kernel module into the into the uh, uh, Kubernetes node first time it's being scheduled there. It also has a health check sidecar, uh, check the health between the L4 and L7. Uh, obviously, only um, after pass the health check, L7 can be added to the L4. Um, once the L7 passes the health check, L4 will actually start the uh, uh, BGP advertising to draw the traffic. Uh, we also use DSR or the direct server return uh, for the egress pass. So meaning uh, when the L7 returns the response back to the end user, it will bypass the um, L4 tier and directly return back to the end user. Uh, that allows us to run much less L4 uh, to match more L7s. So, so next, my uh, colleague Bala uh, gonna talk about the L7 aspect of the Edge Proxy. Hi, uh, I'm going to walk you through in much more detail uh, as to how we run uh, Envoy and uh, like uh, how we, uh, we manage it and uh, also the cases like uh, what are the control plane, how we have integrated with Kubernetes and uh, how is the data plane and what are the features and the optimizations that we have done and, uh, one, and also discuss about one specific use case that we built on top of Envoy uh, called the dynamic caching. Uh, so let me start. So uh, basically, we run Envoy as a container, and uh, it basically is a pod in Kubernetes, and we run it with along with a bunch of other containers uh, that I'll be uh, explaining. And also, we chose with uh, going with the deployment controller, and uh, the reason we chose uh, to use a, a deployment controller resource is the advantages that we get out of it. So basically, things like uh, when you're running Envoy or any L7 proxy, you would want to roll out new features. Uh, pretty often, as well as like, or you want to do some software upgrades or anything that you want to do pretty often. So uh, you will always want to have live traffic being received and then you still want to have a much control when you do this. So uh, Kubernetes provides the rolling update strategy that kind of uh, helps you facilitate where you could say, uh, what is the threshold on which you want uh, the number of pods to be uh, terminated so that you always know that you have a, a set of uh, pods always running and receiving traffic. So this helps you to do in-service uh, upgrades. And also uh, it helps you, uh, deployment controllers helps you to scale up and scale down if you want, uh, as well as it gives you more, much more flexibility uh, in cases like if you want to, uh, if, if you find out your rollout didn't go as expected and you want to pause them, or probably like even roll back them. Uh, so, uh, so that's the reason we went with the deployment controller uh, option. Uh, as my colleague said before, uh, so we are, uh, everything in Kubernetes is spec driven. Uh, so this, is, this part is going to say like how we are going to create the Envoy configuration dynamically. Uh, and uh, again, we have a bunch of specs. So basically the ingress spec is what uh, we use uh, for specifying what is the listener IP you want, what are all the features that you want to turn on, do you want TLS or termination, or it's just going to be HTTP, or do you want GSIB, or any of these features. You could also say like what port you want to uh, listen on and things like that. So this, all these details that basically typically goes under the listener configuration, goes under the ingress spec, uh, and uh, for the routes, basically uh, the ones that uh, Envoy's L7 routes goes uh, as a part of the CRD. Uh, so again, uh, in CRD is as a type of an API uh, resource object that uh, gives you the option to uh, create your own schema 
and uh, uh, Kubernetes will take care of managing it uh, throughout the lifetime of that. Uh, similarly, for the endpoints, basically the, the clusters that the, uh, the, the, the backend pools, you could use the endpoint spec. And uh, so how this works is once you, uh, once you, and the service spec, so once you create all these uh, spec on the API, Kube API server, so the Kube API server uh, realizes these using an, uh, a controller called the ingress controller. So uh, the ingress controller, again, is, uh, is kind of pretty uh, dynamic. You could, uh, it could basically uh, get the task from the API server, and then it could convert it into these specs as, uh, as config maps. Again, Kubernetes resources. So uh, these config maps will again be picked up by the discovery service that will be running as a sidecar container with Envoy. Uh, so I'll be uh, discussing that in the next slide. So uh, what the ingress controller basically does is it, uh, it kinds of uh, whatever proxy you might be using, it kinds of tries to convert your, your uh, legacy style specs into uh, con configs that you could uh, easily dynamically load. Uh, and as you know, let's say if just one endpoint changes, uh, only the endpoint spec would get modified and only your endpoints config map would be changed. Uh, that way all the other configuration would still be the same. Uh, so this, is, uh, this slide tells you more about like how every pod, L7 pod runs. So basically as you see, you have the, uh, the Envoy container and the discovery service and a bunch of other uh, StatsD file beat uh, so containers. So I'll, I'll be mostly talking on the discovery and the Envoy and a little about the init container. So the init container is again one good option where when you want to, uh, when you want to like, uh, when uh, have some task that runs to completion, uh, things like you want to fetch a token or if you want to uh, do some init settings like change your congestion control algorithm or your TCP socket settings, you could have the init container do that for you before the Envoy comes up. Uh, that way things are uh, up and running for you. And, uh, and then the discovery container, so the discovery container mainly watches on the config maps. So what it does is it tries to see if there is any change in the config map and uh, uses the Envoy's LDS, RDS, EDS, and the CDS uh, features uh, to try to uh, update the configuration. And uh, there's an Envoy agent that runs along with the Envoy container. It's a sidecar process that kind of uh, is, uh, is, the, uh, is, the, is the one who tries to uh, boot up Envoy's. So uh, it sees that there is a change in the config and then it loads and then it use, uh, uses the Envoy's hot restart uh, feature uh, to try to dynamically restart the Envoy without any uh, lo uh, loss in uh, traffic. Uh, and uh, we also, uh, let's say you're, you're doing all these and then you, uh, all, we are also using the readiness and the liveliness probe. So the readiness probe, again, this is uh, something that's, uh, that's part of the Kubernetes. So uh, the, the, the readiness probe is something like uh, like you want the container to be up, but you don't want it to be getting the traffic as soon as uh, it comes up. You want to have your own dynamic discoveries or whatever that you are trying to uh, load our applications to get ready. So you you basically have your own healthy endpoint uh, as a part of uh, Envoy, and you could say, you know what, only after all these are probably like the listener socket is uh, open, right? You have things like these, and then you could say, you know what, only after this, deem this container as ready. So uh, what this does is, till that, it, the L4 load balancer would not load balance any traffic to the L7s, uh, and only after the readiness probe kicks in and then is successful, uh, you basically uh, start uh, uh, giving traffic to the Envoy. The liveliness probe on, uh, is basically to, uh, to continuously monitor uh, Envoy if it's running, if the containers for some reason crashes, it is immediately moved out of the consistent hashing table, so that way uh, you don't uh, lose any more, uh, or you don't send any more new connections. Uh, so this kind of uh, says that what the control plane path was. So now I'm going to say a little more on the data plane path. So, uh, so as, as you know, like when we are creating this edge, uh, we are basically trying to replace all the hardware LBs with Envoys. And uh, the, the, the main task that we had to do first was to identify what are all the features that, that's, that were being used in the current hardware LBs and then trying to find the equivalence of Envoy. Envoy mostly had most of them and then we identified a, a few set of uh, features that were like not yet implemented, so we went ahead and implemented it and uh, contributed some upstream too. Uh, so uh, also along with this, once you do this, like because the configurations are huge uh, for a company like eBay, so uh, you basically uh, wrote automation scripts for trying to convert all these hardware configurations to Envoy specific uh, configurations. And also, once you did this, you want to have a way to validate it, right? So uh, again, we came up with uh, a, a few set of uh, a, a way to reverse engineer 
uh, based on the path or the prefix or the query match, we could dynamically generate requests that's going to hit every specific routes and then try to uh, use this uh, tool to send traffic to both the hardware and the software and then see if the response you get back is exactly the same. Uh, we also had RUM, uh, that's basically to, uh, to monitor more on the performance side, whether uh, your edge uh, network is, uh, is, is working as expected, or maybe if you roll out some new features, are you seeing any degradation in performance and things like that. So RUM basically stands for real user metrics. So this is part of, uh, on every eBay page, uh, uh, once the, the actual content is delivered, you have a small JavaScript that tries to download some uh, from the pop and then gives you uh, a, a, a much better uh, information about like how the, how, what was the speed, how, I mean, how, uh, how close it was, it was any retransmissions or things like that. Uh, so that was uh, mostly the migration part. Uh, along with this, for the data plane to get up and running, we had to integrate with uh, a, a bunch of uh, proprietary search management systems that you want to manage like SSL search or anything. Uh, so we, uh, once we got this, uh, we are now looking into the data plane features that we want to enable. Uh, I'm not going to list uh, the awesome features that Envoy provides, but uh, because it's going to be unique for every specific use case, uh, I'm just going to uh, uh, touch a little bit on the certain optimizations that we did on top of Envoy. Uh, and uh, that's uh, so, so one major requirement we had was because it's an edge use case, uh, we always want a, a much better connectivity from the POP to the data center. Right. So what we did was uh, on Envoy, we were able to like uh, have a connection prefetching uh, based on the dynamic, uh, dynamically traffic rate. So you would basically go and see that if the traffic rate is higher, uh, you would want to uh, pre-create or prefetch connections with uh, SSL with the SSLs, so that uh, you don't want any of your requests to be queued at any time. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this was uh, this. After this, we. Uh, based on the stat, we were able to see that the, the queued connection count went down to zero, uh, so delivering much better experience to UBA users. And also, we, uh, we had a, a couple of use cases where you wanted to like drop or reset a particular connection, maybe during for security reasons or whatever. We don't want them to go all the way up to the DC, so we wanted them to do it to be handled at uh, pop. Uh, so what we did was we created an L4 filter that kind of uh, sits uh, uh, along in, in Envoy that uh, kind of watches for whatever you don't want and then drops or resets back the connection. Um, so and also uh, we uh, we wanted a way. Let's say if the connectivity from the edge to the data center is is bad or went down. Uh, you don't want to, your customers to see 503 upstream timeouts. So uh, we came up with a small uh, uh, feature again, says basically called the default cluster, where you want to gracefully handle, uh, gracefully handle the way that you want to show your user uh, a better, uh, for a much better experience rather than showing a, a, a blank page. Uh, so yeah, these are the customizations that we did, and like it was very easy to do it on Envoy because of the existing architecture. Um, Along with this, uh, on, the, on the operating system, we were also able to uh, tweak a, a few settings to, again, uh, to have a much better experience. So one was we were earlier running Cubic and uh, as the TCP congestion control algorithm, and uh, we wanted to adopt uh, BBR. So uh, we went with uh, enabling BBR for the RAM traffic, and uh, we saw like tremendous improvement in the rate the traffic rate at which you deliver it back to the client, and we didn't want to miss that out. So we went ahead and enabled BBR, and as I told before, it's using the init containers, you could uh, turn on BBR and then turn on the Envoys. So similarly, we did a bunch of TCP optimizations, as, uh, like, as simple as uh, turning off slow start, or uh, having a better socket receive or send uh, buffers. So this is a quick uh, glance on how uh, it went through. So if you see the first the line on top, uh, is basically what is the response times uh, if you have it directly terminated at the data center from all over the world. Uh, but the one on the in, in between is what, let's say, uh, it's pretty much close to the hardware LB that's running on the pop, let's, let's say. Uh, but we always don't want to settle with something that is uh, equal, but we want to beat them, right? So what we did was, uh, along with Envoys, uh, we also did the TCP optimizations and ran the BBR optimizations. And if you see to the to the blue part, uh, we are now clearly beating the numbers that uh, and any uh, current or edge uh, hardware LBs could provide with with Envoys and with our customizations. So uh, that's one of the uh, the best things that uh, you'd want to. And yeah, so that that concludes on the on the data plane path. So this is something that I want to say that uh, what you can do on top of Envoy, 
uh, when you run it on the edge. So we created again a new filter that's, uh, that's basically does caching. And uh, when I mean caching, it's dynamic caching. Uh, so dynamic as in like uh, this is something that uh, in a page where you have content that is uh, specific to a geography, like uh, if it's a, if a German customer, you'd want to show him in his specific dollars or whatever. So, uh, so we were able to, uh, uh, we, uh, using the filter that we created, we were able to do it based on, let's say, a path or a specific query or a specific user. So uh, we, uh, we were able to uh, achieve this. Uh, as a part of this, we did, uh, when we created the filter, we did not have the cache stores as on why themselves, but we just used ATS or any other uh, store cache stores that you could use. Um, but uh, again, uh, we used the ring hash LB in Envoy to basically uh, uh, to get your uh, sharding uh, turned on because you would want, let's say, multiple ATS running and you want the, the cache to be stored and retrieved on one of them and you also always want to access them. And that again has to be a, uh, a something that is uh, part of a path prefix or query or you want to uh, crunch that data. So uh, we use the ring hash LB which has support for uh, you providing a string uh, on which you want to hash on and pick the uh, upstream. Uh, so that was again uh, one of the, uh, once we rolled, it, rolled this out a few months back, uh, we started seeing like tremendous uh, improved in the TTFP because uh, now it, it's as simple as we move to the pop, and uh, we got uh, things working, but now we don't even need to access the data center to get the data. Uh, that's, uh, like, as I said, it's 10 times uh, much better. And uh, not only the TTFB, but uh, because you are delivering the content really fast to the user, you are trying to, like, engage them much, like, for them to skim through to see what is the pricing or what is, uh, is this the item I'm expecting or things like that. You're kind of engaging them and don't want them to move to other uh, websites. So, uh, so that's one major advantage that we were seeing. Uh, we also have a few in the roadmap, something like uh, we want to, let's say if someone is searching for, for an item and you want to uh, start caching uh, proactively the top five things that basically is being listed as a part of uh, eBay site. So that, that's something that we are uh, thinking about. Um, again, this is a, a, a very uh, overview of what we got out of, let's say, the response times if you directly hit the DC and the yellow line is uh, with uh, having it as an, as an edge proxy. And uh, what if you? Uh, what is the benefit that you see? The green line is from caching, where uh, it's much, much, much uh, lesser when compared to uh, delivering it uh, as an edge. So, yeah, that's basically it. I'll, uh, I'll, I think you will continue with the observability part. So, uh, coming to the the monitoring or the observability part of the deployment, uh, we uh, use promises for the monitoring purpose and. Uh, we, we replicate the same thing to all of the pops, so it's kind of a self-contained um, uh, stuff. So in each of the pop, we run promise as a pair. Uh, we use a tunnels uh, for the promise HA. From there, the data, the matrix being uh, merged and duplicated and returned to the current interface. Uh, we run Minio um, in each of the pops to, uh, for the, for, to keep the matrix uh, for a longer time period. Um, we haven't got to the part to use promise or tunnels for uh, aggregation across the globe, but we have a centralized Grafana uh, that can read the promise data from each of the pops um, for both L4, L7 metrics, uh, as well as the metrics from other supporting stacks, um, and also uh, metrics from other data sources as well, such as elective search. So a little bit more regarding Envoy specific things, uh, we use SASD, Exporter as a sidecar uh, running together with Envoy uh, to, uh, to receive the histogram data. And that's, that's the exporter in turn exposed to the premise interface um, for a script, a machine server to scraping from. We use FELK for the access lock. Um, so F stands for the file B. So inside each of the L7 part, the file B is res responsible for shipping the uh, access lock out to a centralized lock stage farm. From there, the lock being pro, uh, passed, processed, and then sent to a uh, Kafka data sync, and then in turn being sent back to the data center. Uh, we have a managed uh, elective search cluster there. Uh, from there, we run the analytics jobs uh, for, um, for analytics and alerting purpose. Uh, as for the alerting, we have a alert manager deployed in each of the pops. We also have external checks that check, our, um, check on our public webs 
to ensure everything works from end to end. Uh, we have both static-based alerts, uh, that's uh, alert manager. We also have dynamic-based uh, alerts, uh, that is anomaly uh, detection based on the elective search data. Um, we use Helm for um, our deployment management um, so that it can give us a consistent uh, stack across all the pops. Actually, it's not just about pop, but also um, com consistent deployment in our dev cluster and in our production cluster as well. As you can see from the screenshot here, so everything is packaged into a, a Helm chart. So we have Helm chart for L4 and L7, and with the help of uh, Helm, you actually can deploy multiple clusters of L7 inside the Kubernetes cluster. And from, from there, you, you, you get a single source of truth for everything. For example, what's being deployed, what, what was the version that being deployed, um, and which time frame it was deployed. So that's the superpower we, we, we get from the helm. Um, so next we are going to share some learnings. Um, yeah, so uh, now that like most, uh, more than 50% of the worldwide eBay traffic is being redirect, uh, redirected through the edge and uh, it's Envoy that is basically taking the traffic, uh, we wanted to share uh, uh, a few learnings that we, uh, we, um, we, uh, we, we experienced and we also wanted to highlight what are the challenges that's going forward. Uh, I'm pretty sure most of the part of the community is going to do the same. So uh, in the learnings, basically what we see is, uh, because this is, uh, like this, everything is new here, edge is new, uh, software stacks are new, so you had to rely a lot on testing. Uh, and uh, testing is definitely the, the key part that you would want to make sure that you, uh, you spend an effort and time on uh, to get your uh, thing, uh, initiative successfully. Uh, so uh, the, the ways that we basically did was the hardware to software cross-validation that I explained, RUM for, let's say, for continuously looking for performance uh, metrics that you don't want to, let's say, after a specific rollout of a node, you would probably see that some difference. So you would want to make sure uh, that your performance is always uh, being uh, met. As as well as like new cases, like uh, things like what if a DC goes down, right? What if uh, one of the pop goes down, right? So how are you going to handle these cases, right? So we had to do a thorough rigorous testing of each of these cases before we could start taking uh, production traffic. Uh, so we, so that's, that's one, Test testing is key. And uh, the second part is, okay, now that you have tested and got everything built and everything ready, how are you going to transition it? Like, are you going to turn on a switch and then make sure all the 100% of the traffic is going to go to the software LB? No, right? So you would want to do that in a much controlled manner where, like, you know that, you know what, let me put 1%, 5%. You want to go, go in slices. And uh, for this, you would want to, like, spend some effort in integrating with existing uh, systems in your company where you would want to, like, uh, finally uh, send traffic to multiple systems and then monitor them. Uh, so these are the things that we thought is, uh, is going to be useful for the community as well. And uh, the challenges, and the challenges part, uh, as you know, uh, I mean, we are always growing, so uh, the number of pops keeps increasing every month, right? So uh, now comes the pain part of it, like how are you going to manage the ops? How are you going to make sure there's no drift in the configuration that's being running in each of these pops, right? So uh, we are still thinking about uh, solutions for these, uh, and that's, the, the, that's one of the challenges. And also, again, uh, with, with more power, you get more... Uh, you, got, you, you have to be careful because now with uh, sitting on the edge, you know that exactly what is the uh, amount of data that you'll be getting, you know where the users are, you get, uh, and then you know like uh, how far the users are from the pop and uh, where the users are growing and whether they're coming from mobile or they're coming from desktop and things like that. You would want to do a lot more with such amount of data. Uh, so that's one of the uh, pleasant challenges that we have that we would want to handle and make it of more use for eBay. Uh, and uh, the second thing is because we moved from uh, legacy hardware to uh, uh, Kubernetes, like uh, now comes the problem of uh, debugging and troubleshooting, right? How are we going to do that? Let's say if, if there is a, a P1 case, like how are you going to quickly go ahead and turn on certain things and start debugging it right from, uh, because as you know, Kubernetes is a really complex system. So, uh, so these are the challenges that just we are still addressing and uh, we just thought it would be good to share it. So, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> And yeah, you can go with any Q&A, and we are hiring. Sure. Yeah, one or two questions, please. OK. Um, 
Yep. Yeah, definitely. Uh, as I said, we did uh, contribute some, but these things are more of uh, like basically the, the, the dynamic prefetching was based on a small algorithm that we wrote. We wanted to test it out uh, well and then probably push it upstream. Uh, that way it would be uh, perfect when it, everyone runs it. <laughs> so yeah, we'll definitely, and then also we were in a rush to get all these up and running in a year, year and a half. So we would want to take some time during the summer and then probably do it. So yeah, we'll definitely do it. Yes, please. Um, uh, chaos testing with it is pretty um, manual, I would say. So basically, just to ensure when things go south, our entire entire uh, stack can still function as is. Um, so basically, we we'll just randomly kill this, a certain part of the stack, the L4 and the 7, to ensure the health checking, the alert everything can still uh, work as expected. Meanwhile, we have the, uh, the monitoring uh, going on to make sure we capture all the events um, from, from, the, from the change. Yeah. yeah, it was pretty manual, but at least we did like cases like uh, one of the towers going down, uh, are we handling it? So things like you could run L4s and multiple towers, things like that so that you have internal high availability. Yeah, so we use Helm for that. Yes, so every pop is a Kubernetes cluster. And uh, you have a Helm to know what is the config that's actually running, what is the, what is the latest software version, what are the IPs that you are using, and uh, things like coloring and all those, everything is specific. Yeah, we use uh, pop, uh, Helm to roll out all the changes. If that, that's the, that's your question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. One last question. Uh, yeah, the question is, uh, we, uh, we, were, uh, we were saying that we were running hardware LBs uh, in the edge as well. Yes, uh, so, it, it is the same legacy hardware will be we used in the data center. Uh, instead of growing the data center, we were uh, basically, so how this all evolved was uh, the, initially the networking team uh, had, um, had established these pops where you could have your own uh, eBay network uh, so that you could uh, establish on all of them. And then came the hardware LB journey where you would uh, have a couple of racks and then have the hardware LBs terminating all your connection. And then came the envoy's journey of the uh, purely making it software driven and uh, like using Kubernetes and uh, things like that. Oh. Okay, sure. 